Amen. Amen. All right. This morning I'm going to be preaching a sermon on the subject of hell. And more specifically, I'm going to be preaching the doctrine of hell from the Old Testament scriptures alone. Now, the reason uh, that, that uh, you know, I feel inclined to do this is because there are many people out there, many people that will claim to even be Christians. Obviously, you, know, you would put the Jews into this category as well. There are many people out there that try to deny the existence of hell when it comes to the Christian doctrine. Because we as Christians, we believe that hell is a real, literal place. We believe that that place is located in the center or the core of the earth. The Bible talks about it being in the lower parts of the earth, and, and we're going to get into that. And we believe that it is a place of fire, and specifically it is a place of torment. We believe that there is an afterlife. And that when you die, you are either going to go to heaven and be there for all eternity or you're going to go to hell and be there for all eternity. We believe that is a real, literal place. And we believe that there are souls that are dropping into hell every second. And that is in the center of the earth and they are conscious. And I'm going to show you from the Old Testament that the Bible teaches this Christian doctrine. I'm going to go through the Old Testament scriptures and actually what I have in my sermon notes basically... All it is pretty much is just all the verses just copied and pasted from beginning to end of just all the verses of, that contain the word hell. Just the term hell in the Old Testament, one after the next. So we're going to go in order from beginning to end. There are, you know, of course the Jews who claim, hey, you know, we believe, the, they would say the, it's not an Old Testament to them, but they would say that they believe what we consider to be Old Testament scriptures, right? They claim that. Now, do they believe in hell, whether orthodox or unorthodox? They do not. They believe that when the, we have the word hell in our Bible, that it is just referring to the grave. That it's just referring to the place of the dead. Just the general place of the dead or where people are buried. Where they go when they're dead. And it's not a, 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 an, an on, you know, uh, going conscious state of the soul or anything like that. It's just the grave. That's what they would say, right? And they claim that they believe the Bible. In the first place, you know, of course, that's not true. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you believe me. So they don't believe the Bible in the first place is their problem. Not only that, you know, you have people like Jehovah's Witnesses. You have all these Christians that have been Judaized, and Jehovah's Witnesses fall into the same category because they teach the exact same thing. And they're real big on, you know, trying to transliterate the word from the Hebrew and putting it directly into English. And they'd say Sheol, right? You know, that's the word hell in the Old Testament. Th do you think that they just came up with this on their own? Of course not. Just like how Christians, how Jews were trying to creep in and Judaize Christians in the New Testament scriptures that we read about in the book of Acts, it's not a coincidence that all these other groups, Jehovah's Witnesses and all of these people, and then also those that outwardly proclaim, hey, we're getting back to the Hebrews root, Hebrew roots, they teach the exact same doctrine that Jews teach today. The exact same doctrine about what hell is according to them. Now... I'm going to be going from beginning to end. In the very first mention of the word hell, the first time the word hell or the term hell comes up in the Bible at all, and specifically we're focusing on the Old Testament scriptures, is here in Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Now, there is something amongst Bible students, people that are, are serious students or serious studiers of their Bible, that is called the Law of First Mention. It's a guideline in which you can understand the definition of a word. And this is very, very consistent. Almost every time that you look up a word and the first time that it occurs in the Bible, you're going to find a definition of that word. You're going to find words that are being used synonymous. You're going to find a very clear you know, characterization of what that term or what that word means. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 22, is the very first mention of the word hell in the King James Bible. I want you to look with me at Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 22. The Bible says this, for a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountain. So this is the very first mention of the word hell in the King James Bible. And the very first clause, the very first statement within the first verse says this, For a fire is is kindled in mine anger. We get three words in to the first verse where we find the word hell and you know what we find? Fire. 
for a fire and then he says this is kindled in mine anger so who is the one that is stoking this fire who is the one that is starting this fire of course it is God now what is the purpose of hell God created hell. We are very, very you know, sure of that. The Bible tells us that. God is the creator of hell. He's the creator of all things. And the purpose of it is to fulfill his wrath upon those that have rejected him, upon the wicked, those that have rejected God and rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where his wrath is fulfilled upon them. So notice it says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger. And then it says this, And shall burn unto the lowest hell. So where is this fire located at? Hell. So what is hell? What is in hell? It is fire. We find that out in the very first verse. Not only that, we are, we are told here the direction of where hell is located. What does it say? It says the lowest hell. That tells you that hell is in a lower location. And furthermore, I'm going to exposit this verse a little bit more to you so you can understand exactly what it's saying. Notice what it says next and shall consume, consume the earth with her increase. Now notice that the earth is being consumed with what? This is what you have to put your thinking caps on. With her increase. So what's happening? The fire's growing. And it's saying it's going to consume the earth with her increase. Saying that the fire is growing and when it grows it will ultimately consume the earth with its increase. Saying it's in the core, the center of the earth and then it's growing. Further proof of that is the next statement. It says this, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So where is it located at? It's beneath the foundations of the mountains. It's not just the mountains. It's the foundations that the mountains rest upon or sit upon. So the very first verse, does this sound like a grave? Does this sound like somebody buried six feet under in a tomb over here? It is very clear that it is in the deep, deep parts of the earth and that it's growing to the point where it's going to reach you know, earth, that, the land, the dry land, and then the foundations of the mountains. So notice how the depths of where this is located is being stressed in the very first verse. <coughs> Excuse me, not only that, we're told that it is fire and it's increasing and it's growing. So we get a very clear characterization. We get a very clear idea of what the concept of hell is in the very first verse where we find it. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 22, verse number 6. This is going to be the next mention of the word hell. <clears throat> also, that verse said the lowest hell. It said burn unto the lowest hell. That tells me that there are different layers of hell, right? Just like Jesus said in the New Testament, I'm going to try not to turn to any passages in the New Testament. I can't promise that that's not going to happen, but Jesus said, he spoke that about there being certain people in Matthew chapter number 23, he said that they are going to receive the greater damnation. That makes perfect sense that there would be a lowest hell where it's burning even more so. The other part is where it's increasing. Obviously, so it's not as hot there. The lowest hell is going to be the hottest part. If the source of the punishment is fire, well, of course, the core, the center of where all of the fire is located is going to be the place of the, the greater torment or the greater damnation. And that's why he refers to that because that's where the greater punishment takes place in the lowest hell when he wants to stress his anger. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 22, verse number 6. The Bible says this, The sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. So here we can see that hell and death are being used interchangeable. Hell and death are being used interchangeable here. Not only that, we can see that the sorrows of hell compassed me about. Hell is a sorrowful place. Hell is not a happy place. It is here being spoken of as... You read my mind. I was getting ready to say, give me a drink of water. Uh, it is also being spoken of with the sorrows. It's not a happy place. It's not a pleasant place. He says the sorrows of hell. And then it's used interchangeable with, it says, the snares of death prevented me. So we see death and we see hell both being spoken of there. You know, uh, another thing that we can walk away from this, because people say, well, if death and hell are being used interchangeable, doesn't hell just mean that it's death? Well, you don't, obviously don't understand the Christian doctrine. Because the Bible teaches that the souls of those that go to heaven, they're not dead, they're living. And when the people stand before God and are judged, it says the dead stood before God. He beheld the dead. So dead people, the Bible teaches, are conscious. The people that are in hell, 
they are referred to as the dead and the Bible teaches that Abraham is alive in heaven right now the Bible teaches that Enoch is alive in heaven right now so this jives perfectly with the Christian doctrine I want you to turn now the next mention is in the book of Job Job chapter number 11 verse number 8 Job chapter number 11 the book of Job chapter number 11 verse number 8 <coughs> Job chapter number 11, verse number 8. It says this, It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? And then it says this, Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Now, this in context is speaking, we're going to see this come up a couple of different times. These verses are very important. It's in context talking about you know, the omnipresence, the uh, omni-understanding, you know, the, how God's Spirit is everywhere. It's talking about searching out the understanding of the Lord. It's talking about how He's in all places at all times. And it's stressing the fact that He is in heaven. His understanding, uh, you know, uh, is as high as heaven. And then it's talking about how it's deeper than hell. How it's, the whole purpose of this verse is to spatially include everything. The two extremities. What is the highest point? What, what, what is beyond heaven? Nothing. So he says, it is as high as heaven. There's nothing higher than heaven. And then he says this, deeper than hell. Now notice, higher than heaven, and then what's the exact opposite of that? Is it just the ground? Is it just buried right under the earth? Is it just directly under our feet? No, it's, it says deeper than hell. So where is hell, hell located? It's deep into the ground, deeper than hell, what canst thou know? So notice how the location of hell is being stressed as being deep, very low. Over and over again, we're going to see this. Look at Job 26.6. Job 26.6. <clears throat> Job chapter number 26, verse number 6. I'm going to turn to this one myself. Job chapter number 26. Verse number 6, <clears throat> again this is speaking about, I wanted to verify that, again this is speaking about the power of God. Oftentimes that's uh, what Job and his three friends are speaking about is the power of God. How he's omnipresent, you know, he's omniscient, he knows all these things. And it's saying that nothing is hid from God, that God can see in all places at all times. It says this in Job 26.6, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. I want you to notice there what's used interchangeable with hell. Is it just a place of death? Just a place where a person's unconscious and they're lying and they're, they're not moving, they're, there's nothing going on. Is that what it's talking about? No, it says hell is naked before him, and then it says, and destruction hath no covering. So what's used interchangeable here? Hell and destruction. What does that tell us? That hell is a place of destruction. People are being destroyed in hell. That's what the Bible is teaching. Not only that, the reason why it says hell is naked before him is because hell is the place that is covered more than any other place. Hell is the place that, that, is, that would be the hardest. You know, people, they've tried to drill into the center of the earth. People have tried to get down into the center of the earth. It's deep. It would be the most difficult place to navigate to, right? From the perspective of us knowing, of course, that God is in heaven, what from, from just, just the, the speaking from a physical standpoint, what is the most hid place from God? It would be the center of hell, you would say, right? Those in the center of hell. It's covered the most. It's inside of the earth, right? And it's stressing the fact that God sees all things. So it says this, hell is naked before him. Saying it's naked. He sees everything in there. And then it says, and destruction, saying in his eyes, hath no covering. That he can look into the center of the earth and it doesn't matter whether it's inside the core of the earth. God can see it. We'll see this again in just a minute. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 9 verse number 17. That's taught again that same concept elsewhere. Psalm chapter number 9 verse number 17. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 9 verse number 17. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 9, verse number 17 says this, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and then it says, And all the nations that forget God. Now notice specifically who's going to hell and who it speaks of as going to hell. It says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. So who is in hell? The wicked. Notice how it doesn't just say the dead. The dead are in hell. No, it specifically mentions here 
that the wicked are in hell. The wicked are in hell. And then it restates that. What is it that's wicked about them? Why are they wicked? It says, in all the nations that forget God. So according to Psalm chapter number 9, verse number 17, it's not just the dead that are in hell. Specifically, it's the wicked. And even more specifically, it's those that forget God. It's those that have rejected the Lord. That is the dwelling place of those that go to hell. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 16, verse number 10. Psalm chapter number 16, verse number 10. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 16, verse number 10 says this, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And this is, of course, quoted in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 31. It is a passage uh, that is prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking how, about how the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died, his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights. And I plan on touching on that here more in just a few minutes. But notice what's mentioned here that's in hell. A soul is in hell. It specifically mentions that souls are in hell. Go to Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 5. This is actually just uh, the same passage that we read a moment ago in, in 2 Samuel. It's just also quoted here. Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 5. The Bible says, The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. So death and hell are used interchangeable and we see that there are sorrows in hell. There are sorrows that are pertaining to or of hell. Go to Psalm 55, 15. Psalm chapter number 55, verse number 15. So we're just going to work our way through the Bible from beginning to end here as far as the Old Testament scriptures and see the word hell mentioned each time. Psalm chapter number 55, verse number 15 says this, Let death seize upon them, and then it says this afterwards, and let them go down quick into hell. Again, where is hell located? It's down, down quick into hell. Now, does that jive with where we started in Deuteronomy 32? Perfectly. It, it, it makes perfect sense. It's perfectly consistent with that idea because it's below the foundations of the mountains. It's deep. It's the, he spoke about the lowest hell. It says, go down quick into hell. And then it goes on. It says this, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Notice for. That means because. These are wicked, evil people. People, again, that have forgotten or rejected the Lord. Go to Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 13. Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 13. <clears throat> Psalm 86, 13. The Bible says, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Notice over and over again when it's talking about, you know, uh, David being delivered from there, he says, you delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Again, we see the lowest hell mentioned. And where was the lowest hell again? It was in the center of the earth. It was spoken of as being in underneath the foundations of the mountains. Go to Psalm chapter number 116, verse number 3. Psalm chapter number 116, verse number 3. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 116, verse number 3, the Bible says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Notice all the negativity here with hell. That's another thing that we can see. And death and hell are interchangeable again. Go to Psalm chapter number 139, verse number 8. Psalm chapter number 139, verse number 8. <clears throat> Two things that we can learn from this verse, Psalm chapter number 139, verse number 8. The Bible says, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Again, he is contrasting the two most extreme locations that exist spatially. He says, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And then he says, If I make my bed in hell, Behold, thou art there. So he's trying to choose out in, in the, most lo the, the locations that are the most opposite from one another. The most polar opposite locations. So he contrasts heaven with hell. Not only that here, it tells you 
Also, that God is omnipresent. It's the same teaching that we saw just a moment ago in the book of Job, uh, Job 11. Now, I want you to go to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and specifically chapter 5, verse number 5. Chapter 5, verse number 5. Over and over again, the location of hell is brought up repeatedly, over and over again. And it's talking about it being in the earth. It's down low. Right in the very beginning, what do we see? That it's fire. It's sorrow. Look here in Proverbs chapter number 5, verse number 5. It says this, Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Death and hell being used interchangeable once again. And where does it say it's located? Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Proverbs chapter number 7, verse number 27. These are almost uh, um, redundant. They're very, very similar to one another, all of these verses, teaching the same thing. <clears throat> chapter 7, verse number 27 says, Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So we see the location. That's one thing that we can see over and over again that's stressed heavily that it's down, it's deep down into the earth. Proverbs chapter number 9, verse number 18. Go over to Proverbs chapter number 9, verse number 18. It says, But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Where is hell located? Again, once more, it's redundant, but this is what the Bible's teaching. Depths, it's deep, it's low, it's in the earth. Look at Proverbs 15, 11. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 11. If hell is just the place of the dead, if it's just where you know, people are just, it's just the location that is describing you know, uh, uh, that there is no consciousness. That's, that is like a verbatim description that they would give you. It's just a place of no consciousness. That is what people say over and over again. Whether it be the Jews, whether it be some guy who's been Judaized, the, you, know, you speak to Jehovah's Witnesses about it, they say it's just a place of no consciousness. You know, and they'll point you to verses like in Ecclesiastes how, you know, the dead know nothing at all. And that's what they'll say. It's like just a place where there's nothing going on. You're, 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 just, it's, you're just not conscious, right? You have no being. That's what they're saying. But look at this. Explain to me how this makes sense. Look at Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 11. It says this. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. You notice that? So once again, what is hell likened with? Destruction. It says, hell and destruction are before the Lord. Over and over again, we see the word destroyed and destruction being used with the word hell. So what is it teaching? It's telling you that hell is a place of destruction. It's not that hard to figure out. It's a place where people are destroyed. What was the very first description of hell? It said, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. And what does the New Testament clearly teach over and over again about the location of hell? That it is a place of torments and that it is a place also of fire. It's a place where the dead are, but they are conscious and they are being destroyed. They are being punished and they are being tormented. So wouldn't it make perfect sense if we go back to the Old Testament and we look up the word hell that we'd find the word fire? Wouldn't that make perfect sense? Wouldn't it make perfect sense if we looked up the word hell that would mention sorrows, that would mention trouble, that it would mention the word destruction or destroyed over and over again? And what do we see repeatedly? Hell and destruction. Not only that, the New Testament's very clear that where is hell located? It's under the earth. It's in the center of the earth. It's in the heart of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ said. The heart of the earth. Where does the Bible point you to every time in the Old Testament? Deep down. It's stressing that the location is deep into the earth. Deep below your feet. Deep under us. Proverbs 15, 11 is teaching the same thing that we saw a moment ago in Job chapter number 11. That God sees all things and that He sees all things also in hell, which is a very, of course, enclosed location. It says this in Proverbs 15, 11, Hell and destruction are before the Lord, saying He sees all these things. Then it says this, How much more than the, the hearts of the children of men? Saying this, if God can see deep down into the earth in such an enclosed place, how much more does he know the thoughts of your heart or the thoughts of your mind? How much easier would it be to know your hearts and your, the, the children of men, those that are living in the land of the living, you know, if he can see deep down into hell? That's obviously nothing for him. That's what the purpose of that verse is, the meaning behind that verse. Uh, same chapter, go to verse number 24. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 24. <clears throat> 
Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 24 says this, The way of life is above to the wise. So what, what direction does it point you to for life here? The way of life is above to the wise. Then it says this, that he may depart from hell beneath. Where is hell located? Beneath. And what is it contrasted with? Hell and life are contrasted there, being opposites of one another. Antonyms. Go to Proverbs chapter number 23, verse number 14. Proverbs chapter number 23, verse number 14. <clears throat> Bible says, Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Notice that hell is somewhere where we need to be delivered from. Don't we see that in the New Testament? It's somewhere that we need to be saved from. It's somewhere that we need to be delivered from. And specifically, being taught in the New Testament, if a person were to go to hell, what about that person goes to hell? Their soul. Over and over again, what does it speak about? Their soul being delivered from hell. Proverbs chapter number 27, verse number 20. Proverbs chapter number 27, verse number 20. Notice this again. Hell and destruction are never full. What is hell? It's a place of destruction. And then it says, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So it's talking about hell and destruction never being full. And it says, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Saying, it's, it's always getting larger. I want you to go to Isaiah 5, 14 and we'll see this even clearer. So it says, hell and destruction are never full. It's always growing. What did the very first verse talk about hell doing? That it was increasing. It was growing. Hell was growing. Well, look at Isaiah chapter number 5, verse number 14. If, if this is just this place of uh, just a state, they don't even say that it's a literal location. They're just saying that it's a state of unconsciousness, right? What does it mean that it's growing? And what does it mean that the fire is located there and it's increasing? It makes zero sense because there are specific elements that are actually describing that state if it's a state. Fire is in this state. Destruction is in this state. Look at Isaiah chapter number 5 verse number 14. It says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. So what's going on? It's getting bigger. What did Deuteronomy 32, 22 say? It said that it was increasing. It was growing. What did Proverbs 27, 20 say? It said hell and destruction are never full. It's getting bigger and bigger. Look at Isaiah 14, uh, Isaiah 5, 14 further. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. Now watch this. This is going to become relevant here in just a moment. And opened her mouth without measure. Notice it's without measure. It's massive. It's huge. It's enlarging itself. And it says, and opened her mouth. When you open your mouth, what are you doing? Right? When we just try to describe inanimate objects, oftentimes we'll use things to relate them to a person, like baseboards. It's the bottom of something. Oftentimes you talk about the feet of a couch, or the, the, the foot of this, or the foot of that. So we'll liken unto a person. When you swallow something, you as a person, where does it go? It goes into your stomach, right? It goes down into your belly, right? That's going to become relevant here in just a moment. Now, it says here, it hath in, without measure, and it says, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, that's talking about their pride, and he that rejoiceth, watch this, shall descend into it. Where are they going? They're going down. And what's happening? Hell is enlarging herself and opening her mouth without measure. Keep that in mind. Go to Isaiah 14, 9. Isaiah chapter number 14, 9. Here in just a couple of verses, we're going to reference back to that. Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 9. It says this, Hell from where? Beneath. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee. Watch this. At thy coming. Notice that. So people are coming here and they're being met there. It stirreth up, watch this, the dead for thee. So who's located there? The dead. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Go to Isaiah 14, 15. Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 15. Same chapter, look at verse number 15. It says this, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. Where's hell located? Beneath. Over and over again. It's redundant at this point. To the sides of the pit. Now I want you to notice there what's mentioned with hell. What is it? The pit is mentioned here. It says to the sides of the pit. Now if we go to the New Testament, and I'm trying to stay away from New Testament passages, the pit is mentioned and hell is mentioned and it's called a bottomless pit. 
right? And this is clearly a place of torment. There are there is you know smoke ascending out of it when hell is opened up because there's fire inside of it, which is of course taught in the Old Testament. Notice how here when the pit is spoken of, it's also a bottomless pit because it just mentions the sides of the pit, right? Well, I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 16, verse number 28. Now, this is the first time in relation to what would be uh, not a physical pit that it is spoken of. Not a physical pit as in what I'm referring to is just like a hole. Like a, you know, if we had just like a, an eight-foot hole that's dug right here, we'd call that a pit. If you look up the word pit or the pit or a pit really in the King James Bible, the times that it comes up are, number one, with Joseph. That's the first time. It's repeated a few times there in like uh, Genesis 37. Then it's spoken of in, in Exodus, uh, I think it's 21. Exodus chapter number 21 where it's talking about if a man digs a pit and he doesn't cover it and an ass or an animal falls into it, then he's got to pay back the guy, right? Then um, I think it's used one other time just about just a, a hole. Another time, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's in maybe the book of uh, Exodus later on in that, that particular book. And it's again, it's clearly just talking about a regular pit that's dug, right? The very next time you see the word come up is here in Numbers chapter number 16. Numbers chapter number 16, this is when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram are coming and they're, they're, they, you know, they're desiring the priesthood also as uh, you know, uh, uh, Moses says to them and they're not happy with just being of the children of Levi. So like, seemeth it a small thing you know, to be of the, of the family of Levi and, and having all of these blessings that are given unto you? So they're not happy with what they're given, so the wrath of God is kindled against them. Now I want you to notice what takes place here in verse number 28. It says this, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. Verse number 29, If these men die the death, the, I'm sorry, die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, and he says this, then the Lord hath not sent me. Verse 30, now watch this. But if the Lord make a new thing, watch this, and the earth open her mouth. Now a moment ago when it talked about the earth opening her mouth, what was it specifically talking about? Going down into where? Into hell. When it talked about the mouth opening and hell enlarging itself, that was in Isaiah 5.14, it specifically mentioned the mouth, right? So it says this, And the earth openeth her mouth and swallow them up. Then it goes on and says this, With all that appertain unto them, saying all that pertain, all of their family. And they go down, watch this, quick into the pit. So where are they going? Where is the pit located? It's down. It's down into the pit. And it specifically talks about the, their, the earth opening up its mouth. Now, notice that phrase, Go down quick into the pit. Just a moment ago, I read to you from the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms, and it says this in Psalm 55, 15. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. You notice that? The same exact phrase. And what is going on there, it's being used interchangeable when it talks about them going down quick into hell. It's talking about them going down quick into the pit in number 16. And then we saw also in hell... It has a mouth. It's enlarging itself, right? Keep reading there. Verse number, where did we leave off? Verse 30. Look at verse number 31 now. It says this, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertain unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and it says, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were around, that were round about them fled at the cry of them for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. So where did they go? The Bible says they went down into the pit. They went down in, so where is the pit when we see this phrase used repeatedly? It's used interchangeable with hell. It's not just a small hole. It's not just the place of hell. It's not just poetic and figurative about where people that die go in a state of unconsciousness. It tells you specifically where the pit is located and what had to happen in order for them to descend into that pit. The earth opened up 
and clave asunder and they dropped down where into the center of the earth now our first verse which is our foundation gave us super clear descriptions of where hell was located and where was it beneath the foundations of the mountains is that where the dead go is your body going to go in beneath the foundations of the mountains that is ridiculous but you know what over and over again we see is that hell is described as being deep very low why because it's in the center of the earth and in order when a person dies their soul descends down into the center or the core of the earth according to the Bible you cannot defend you could not defend against the teaching of the Old Testament of hell being the center of the earth there's no way over and over and over again it is a place of destruction it is a place that is beneath the foundations of the earth it stresses that it's so low that it's just as low in contrast as as high as heaven is so if you contrast the two these are the extremities of spatial locations high as hell deep or I'm sorry high as heaven deep as hell go to Isaiah chapter number 28 verse number 15 Isaiah chapter number 28 verse number 15 <clears throat> the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 28 verse number 15 because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through it shall not come unto us for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves notice death and hell are used interchangeable go to Isaiah 28 18 just three verses later and your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through then you shall be trodden down by it go to Isaiah chapter number 57 verse number 9 Isaiah chapter number 57 verse number 9 <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 57 verse number 9 the Bible says and thou wentest to the king with ointment and didst increase thy perfumes and didst send thy messengers far off and didst debase thyself even unto hell what is that it's very low that is the point of the passage is saying you debase yourself so low you're even unto hell go to Ezekiel 31 16 Ezekiel chapter number 31 verse number 16 now we're just looking at the word hell every time. The concept of hell is taught in other words in uh, you know, the word the pit uh, and also another word we're going to look at right now which is nether parts, a phrase actually, a couple of words that are coupled together, the nether parts. Now the word nether just means lower, like the Netherlands, it's, it's the, the lower lands. So when we see the word nether parts, what it's saying is lower parts. And this exact phrase to prove that, you know, it's all our, our understanding needs to come from the King James Bible. That is our authority repeatedly by comparing scripture with scripture. And you can find that exact phrase in the King James Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that is lower parts. And it's being used interchangeable in the same context where it's speaking about the nether parts. It's also speaking about the lower parts. So if you weren't familiar with what nether meant, you could always just rely upon the King James Bible's built-in dictionary and deduce what it means from the Bible itself. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 31, verse number 16. Ezekiel chapter number 31, verse number 16, it says this, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. And this is a parallel, if you're not familiar with that, with Isaiah 14. When I cast him down to hell, with them that descend into the pit. Now notice in this verse, that's why I included number 16 once pit was mentioned for the first time there in our verses with, coupled with hell. Notice what's coupled with hell now again. The pit. We see the pit being used interchangeable when it says that he's going down to hell. It says he cast him down to hell. It says with them that what? Descend into the pit. So it is correct to say when a person goes to hell that where are they going? They're descending into the pit. They're both true. The, the hell is actually referred to in the New Testament, as I mentioned, as the bottomless pit. Remember, the angel had the key, it says, to the bottomless pit. That is a reference that he had the key to hell. It says further, keep reading there where we left off in verse 16, And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted. It says this, 
it's being you know, uh, uh, sarcastic or facetious, if you will, shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Now, as I said, nether there means lower. So again, what is it talking about? It's talking about the low parts of earth. It's deep down into earth. Look at verse number 14. So right there in chapter 31, just look back a couple of verses. Verse number 14, it's not the word hell, but we're going to see the word nether used here. Look at verse 14. It says, To the end that none of, none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees shall stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered, look at this, unto death. They're given up unto death is what it's saying. Watch this. Where is it located? To the nether parts of the earth. In the midst of the children of men with them that, watch this, go down to the pit. According to number 16, where is the pit located? It's located, the earth, in order for the people to go down into this pit, the earth had to clave asunder, that means to tear apart, and to, asunder means like separate, and they went down into the pit. Here we see them going down in where? The nether parts of the earth. To say that death, or to say that hell, is just a place of, you know, where there's just no consciousness, is absolutely ridiculous. Because over and over and over again, you know what the best definition for, you know, let me say, let me word it this way. Do you know what is, hell is characterized almost every single time and the majority of the time with? Not necessarily pain and sorrows. We see that repeatedly. We see it being characterized with fire, but every single time is being characterized or described as being very low in the earth. Extremely low, down, deep. And it's, and it's stressing that it's not just under the earth. It's not just a little bit low. It's underneath the foundations of the earth. That is the main description of, where, of hell in general. It's of where hell is located and that you must descend in order to get there. So to say that it's just a, a state of no consciousness is absolutely ridiculous because we're given a very clear description over and over again of hell, repeatedly. And one of the main things is that it's deep and that it's low and it's in the nether parts of the earth. Go to Ezekiel 32, 24. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 32, verse number 24. Ezekiel chapter number 32, verse number 24, the Bible says, There is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised, watch this, into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. There's another verse where we see pit and nether parts used interchangeable. Go to Ezekiel 31, 17. You know, go to Ephesians 4 real quick. I thought about going here uh, um, earlier in the sermon. That's why I said I, I'm going to try to stay out, but I, I am going to go here just because we see nether used there, nether parts. Lower parts is also used in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms a few different times. If you look up the word lower parts, it's in the book of Psalms and it's in the same discussion. It's talking about going down into the lower parts of the earth, being his soul being delivered from the lower parts of the earth. It's, it's, it's a clear reference to a place of the afterlife, a location of afterlife where people are punished and he's delivered from there because it's a bad place. It's a place of fire, of course. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4. This is speaking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It says this in verse number 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now verse 9. Now that he ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now we are told very clearly, very, very clearly about where Christ's body was buried, what actually took place with his physical flesh and blood. And he was taken, his body was taken and put into a tomb. There is no way that you could try to twist this to say that it's a state of unconsciousness. It clearly teaches that he went down into where? the lower, he first descended. Think about what's being contrasted. When it's saying that he ascended, isn't that a state of consciousness? Isn't he actually going and he's conscious to where he's at? He goes up where? To heaven. And it's an actual location where he's going. Okay? Well, that is being contrasted with what? 
the fact that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So over here we see him being conscious, he's alert, he's alive, he's obviously awake. I mean, it's the Lord, goodness sakes. But where does he go? Up into heaven. So what is being taught when it's contrasted? What's the point? You know, it's showing that there, that there are differences, but there are all, everything that's contrasted, the point is, of course, to make show the difference between something, but there's also similarities there. There has to be a similarity in order to compare the two in any way, whether it's a contrast or not. So he descended into the lower parts of the earth. So that also, the only way that, that makes sense is that also is a place of consciousness. And not only that, it's a place where you're actually literally descending. When Christ went to heaven, did he literally ascend to heaven? Everyone would agree with that. Those that reject that hell is a place of fire and torment, they would even agree with that, wouldn't they? Well, then what in the world does it mean that he descended? Maybe it means that it's the literal lower parts of the earth. Maybe it means just like when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram went down quick into the pit. Went down into hell. Maybe, you know, if we want to get an idea of what it means, that these phrases... You just look them up repeatedly and you'll ultimately find a definition. And the Bible will give you an example of a person actually doing that. So if you see the phrase being used, you know, as an example, go down quick into the pit. Look up when a person actually does that. If we want to know what it is, look up when that actually takes place. One time in the whole Bible. Where it's described and it uses that language. You know where it's at? Number 16. You know what happens? They literally go down into the pit. And where is it? It's the center of the earth. The earth opens her mouth and they drop down in. We see, this, we see all of these consistencies over and over again because it's the same doctrine. Enlarging herself, increasing herself, there's fire. You know, the Old Testament teaches the doctrine of hell just as strong as the New Testament does. Every single mention... I can use to back up my doctrine and debunk these fools that reject that hell is a place of fire. Every mention is a place of destruction, place of fire, a place down deep into hell. It's a pit. It's so stinking clear. You know, you have to, you do, you have to just completely reject the Bible and the gospel in order to reject the doctrine of hell. If someone does not believe that there's a literal hell, that person is not saved. I don't care if they believe every other doctrine about the gospel. You have to, in order to believe the gospel, you have to believe that he's saving you. And what he is saving you from is, the whole purpose is that he's saving you from hell. That is what you are being delivered or saved from. You know, when the Bible uses the word death, it's not just a physical death. That encompasses hell as well. And the gospel, you know, is when, when it's talking about us being delivered, he delivered us, he saved us. That is being saved from our punishment. And you must understand that your punishment is in what you are deserving of is to burn in hell. I want you to go now to Ezekiel chapter number... Do we go to 3117 yet? No, we have not. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 31, verse number 17. Ezekiel chapter number 31, verse number 17. The Bible says, They also went down into hell. Notice, down. With him unto them that be slain with the sword. And they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. So notice how going down into hell happened after they were slain with the sword. Go to Ezekiel 32. The very next chapter, Ezekiel chapter number 32, verse number 21. This is interesting. It says this in Ezekiel 32, 21. It says, The strong among the mighty shall speak to him, watch this, out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down, they lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. So where are they? They've gone down. But not only that, what's going on in hell? People are speaking in hell. Kind of like New Testament doctrine, Father Abraham, sin Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So what's he doing? He's speaking out of the midst of hell. Just like here, what do we have going on? Someone speaking while they're in hell. They're still able to speak and talk, just like the rich man did in Luke 16. Go to verse number 27 now. Ezekiel chapter number 32, same chapter, verse number 27 says this, And they shall not lie with the mighty, 
that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. And they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Go to Amos chapter number 9. Amos chapter number 9. We've just got a couple of mentions left. Amos chapter number 9, verse number 2. <clears throat> Amos chapter number 9, verse number 2, the Bible says this. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So there's this very strong consistency of a theme that is taught throughout what, maybe three, possibly four verses now, where God is stressing His power, His omnipresence, and how nothing is hid from Him. And He's trying to say here, though they dig, watch this, though they dig into hell. Do you think that that's just a couple of shovels? Just, just a couple of shovelfuls of, of, of dirt thrown to the side. It's just six feet under. No, He's stressing that even if you dig down into hell. But notice that it says, notice how it's worded, though they dig into hell. It's, it's speaking, it's like a hyperbole. It's exaggerated language. Can they literally ascend up to heaven? No. You know what else they can't do? They couldn't physically and literally dig down into hell. He's saying if it was possible for you to even dig into hell, I'd take you up out of there. He's saying that there is nowhere where you can hide from me. There is nowhere where you can get out of my presence, just like David made the, almost the exact same statement. He said, if I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God is in all places at all times, showing, again, the extremity of the locations being polar opposites. Look at uh, Jonah chapter number 2, verse number 2. Now this time, with jo in Jonah's case, it is obviously and very clearly meant to be figurative. Just like when the Bible talks about the mouth of hell, or the mouth of the earth, it says, does the earth have a literal mouth? It's not a literal mouth, right? But if, if the earth, if you were to consider the earth opening up and the rim of that hole where it had clave asunder, right? And if you consider that the mouth, what would you consider the center or the core of it to be? Like I mentioned earlier. The belly, the stomach of it, right? So look here in Jonah chapter number 2, verse number 2, it makes perfect sense when he's trying to make this parallel. And of course this is prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this in Jonah chapter number 2, verse number 2, And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest me. So that would make perfect sense that if he's in the stomach of this whale, that he would refer to that place poetically or figuratively as what? As hell. Notice that there has to, in order to draw this parallel, in order for this to be figurative in the first place, there has to be similarities. I want you to think about a few things. Number one, he's crying. Did we see that already where, pe where we have other verses that speak about people speaking from hell, speaking out of the midst of hell? Yes. Number two, what is it? It's a place of affliction. Number three, what is it? That he's in the center of what? His belly. He's in the stomach of it. So in order for this to be a figure, you have to have similarities with actual hell in the first place. What in the world does this have similar with a state of unconsciousness? It's stupid and it's ridiculous. But when you start with the true and right understanding of the Christian doctrine of what hell actually is, this makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Because he's in the belly of hell. And what is going on? He's afflicted. He's being tormented. And he's crying and screaming out. Luke 16 again. It's the best reference of where we actually see a record of someone while they're in hell. What's he doing? He's in hell. He's down deep. Right? Just like he's deep into the belly. And what's he doing? He's crying and screaming out. And what's going on? He's afflicted. What's, Jonah ha what's happening to Jonah? He's being tormented. He's being afflicted. That's what takes place in hell. So doesn't it make perfect sense with our view? Doesn't this line up as a perfect picture of hell? Perfect picture of hell. Makes perfect sense. And this is, of course, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we can see that this is a picture. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, you know, uh, uh, even as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. So notice how the heart of the earth, the center of the earth, the belly of the earth, is contrasted with the belly of the whale. And 
It says heart of the earth. Now, is, was that tomb, was Jesus in the heart of the tomb? That's ridiculous. Would you consider that the heart of the earth, him being in that tomb? Of course not. That's, that's silly and makes no sense. But, just as we saw elsewhere, if it's the lower parts of the earth, and the Bible tells us that Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? This verse only makes sense and, and only is consistent with the Christian doctrine of hell. That's the only way that you can make sense of this verse. No other way. It fits perfectly. That's why it would be used as a picture of literal hell. Go now. This is the last mention. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 5. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 5. <clears throat> to say that the Bible in the Old Testament does not teach hell is honestly one of the most uh, theologically ridiculous statements that people make. The Old Testament so clearly teaches the doctrine of hell. The Christian doctrine of hell that we subscribe to, that is. <clears throat> people will try, even people like James White even, they even will look at the Old Testament and therefore, you know, transliterating the, the word Sheol into, you know, uh, uh, the English, just taking the word and just putting it straight in English. Because even he, when he reads a lot of these verses, he would say, yeah, that's not talking about, you know, the place of torment. He's a fool. I mean, every single mention, every single mention that we looked at, wouldn't everyone agree that it's a clear description of what we believe? Every single time that it's brought up, a clear description. It's deep, it's down, it's in the lower parts of the earth, it's in the other parts of the earth. To say that that is the grave, and that's what they'll say, well, Sheol means grave. Number one, why didn't you translate it as grave then? Sometimes they do that, but therefore, translate or transliterating it oftentimes as Sheol, and then they want to tell you in the English that it's grave. Well, why in the world didn't you just translate it as grave then? What sense does that even make? And the reason, of course, is because he wants to be the authority. He loves when you say, what does shale mean, Dr. White? Tell me what shale means. Well, come sit down at my desk and let me explain to you, you know, with all my books behind me, what shale actually means. Why not just translate it as grave? What sense does that even make? Because, number one, it's an attack on the Christian doctrine of hell. Shale, what English speaker picks up their Bible and they get to a passage where it would say hell, but they read Shale and they think, oh, that's a place of fiery torment. Ah, and they just go to the next verse. No one. No one would do that. That's ridiculous. So what is it doing? What would be the reason? Because we're not ignorant of his devices, the devil that is. What did he do the first time he came up? He always cast doubt on the Word of God. He's always trying to corrupt the Word of God. So what would be the purpose? Well, let's look at the result. And then we can reverse engineer what's going on here. What happens is it causes confusion and it makes people not understand that hell is a place of torment. Because everyone knows what hell means. If any English speaker, I don't care if you're churched or not, if you read a verse that said hell, they're all going to picture fire, torment, deep parts of the earth. Every person. Everyone. But what are they going to think when they read Sheol? They're not going to have a stinking clue. So how does the devil benefit from that? Well, it causes that person not to be fearful of hell. Do you know what drives the majority of people to get saved? And I can say this from anecdotal evidence from my own, in my own life, that when I was 12 years old, I was scared as can possibly be when I first came to the realization that I am going to die and go to a place of torment, Amen. a place of fire, a place of punishment, a place that's in a dark place in the nether parts of the earth where there's torments and there's fire and people are screaming out. I mean, do you think the rich man was the only, people ye the only person yelling? Every single person is screaming in hell right now. Every single person that is in hell is screaming out at the top of their lungs. And you know what it causes people to do when you take out the word hell and put in Sheol? It causes people to not be afraid and to not think about a place that is probably that person's destiny at that moment. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. Every single change in the Word of God is calculated. They're not accidental. It is the devil trying to corrupt the Word of God to cast doubt in people's minds or otherwise deceive them into believing something other than what the Bible teaches. Every single time. So you look at these, these, these stupid, corrupt modern Bible versions and all of these changes, don't think they're accidental. These people are not good-hearted. You know, these are, these are tools and instruments of the devil. Yeah. 
Amen. You look at the, the, the lives of these people, like you know, Westcott and Hort, who were used to put these. These guys were 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 stinking, you know, into mysticism. They were, you know, part of these these secret societies. They were wicked, wicked, evil people. You know, they're they're worshiping Mary. They're Catholics. Every single one of them. You look at the NIV, and uh, one of the women who was who was uh, basically an advisor, an editor on the board, is a stinking dyke. Can you imagine if you wanted to translate a Bible, which God forbid none of you would ever want to do that, that you would reach out. Oh, she's got great skills. You would reach out to a woman that is a lesbian to say, hey, can you look at this for me and see if we translated this property properly? Just give me some advice on whether or not we translated this properly. And it's just a coincidence that in those Bibles they removed the word sodomite. That's just a coincidence. When, you, when I say sodomite, everybody understands that that is a pejorative, derogatory term. It's like the word faggot. I don't like these people. You know, you don't use the word sodomite. You know, you, you don't find a guy, you know, or a, a, a girl, because girls more often nowadays will have friends that are, are, that are uh, homos, right? They would never say like, yeah, my friend's a sodomite. They're not going to say that because it's derogatory. So why do you think all of a sudden this NIV version that comes out removes the word sodomite? When they had a sodomite who was the advisor on what language to use specifically. The types, that's what she is, her profession. If you actually look her up and do your own research, she specifically is, is a, a, a professional in what language to use. Like how to word things. That's her profession. So that's how she trains people, how to word things. You know what? Sodomite doesn't sound very good. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that the NIV also removes, you know, the word hell all the time. I don't think it shows up in the whole Old Testament. Why do you think? Because a lot of the people, probably all of the people, I'm sure all of the people, that translated the NIV are going to hell. That's why. Right. They want to take it out. And the devil is using these people so that, number one, he can... He can, he can cause people to put out of their minds and get it out of our, our vocabulary, words like sodomite, words like hell, to where people just aren't thinking about, you know what caused me to get saved? Thinking about punishment and torment. So if if pe those good-hearted people that are deceived, that aren't saved, that maybe have an NIV, when they read through the Old Testament, it's possible that the idea of hell, you know, I'm sure there are other passages where you can definitely derive the concept. But it's not in their mind even, you know, even close to the amount that it would be in the King James Bible. Do you know what's going on? Is God, the devil is trying to take out the idea of hell. Why do you think Jesus is constantly talking about hell in the New Testament when he's preaching the gospel? Because that, that idea, the fear, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It drives you to salvation. When you understand that there is a Lord that is a just God that will really punish you and send you to a fiery torment... That puts the fear of God in your heart and it will push you to salvation. It will drive you to salvation. Amen. And that's why the word hell is removed from the NIV and all these other versions. They put in stupid words like Sheol. I don't speak Hebrew, moron, and you already knew that. Why are you putting a Hebrew word in an English book given to American English, American speaking, uh, or uh, Americans that speak English that Here's the thing. All these other, most of the countries in, in the world today, they speak multiple languages. Yeah, if you know people from other languages. But you know something about Americans? Because we speak the universal language, the majority only speak one. English. Because we don't ever meet anybody that doesn't speak English. People, obviously, Americans don't normally leave the United States because we live in a very prosperous place. People from other countries are constantly leaving, but they're being taught English. It's the universal language. It's also known as the, uh, the business language. Right? So, why would you put a Hebrew word into an, uh, you know, the English language where it's going to be read by Americans that have not only speak only one language, pretty much all of us, but on top of that are not very familiar with other languages in general. Just don't know a lot about other languages. Why? Does that sound like they want you to understand what that word means or not to understand it? They do not want you to understand what Sheol means. I don't even know if, whether they could have put anything in there. You know, uh, they could tell me that that word is whatever in Hebrew and I wouldn't have a clue whether they're telling me the truth or not. I wouldn't have any idea because I don't speak Hebrew. 
But do you know what the purpose is in the first place? It's because they know that you're ignorant. The devil knows that you're ignorant. The devil knows that people will be deceived by this and they won't have a clue what that's talking about. It's not going to cause you to think of fiery torment. Not at all. Not even close. It's just going to cause you to read right over it. That's why we are King James Bible only. Amen. Every time the word hell shows up in the Old Testament, it's very clear what it's talking about. And it's very clear it should be there. Descending down deep, that doesn't sound like a grave. Beneath the foundation of the earth, that's not a grave. That's what they'll try to tell you that Sheol is. Oh, it's just speaking about a grave. There's fire there. You know, what grave is there just God's anger kindling a fire? You know, it's ridiculous. It's stupid and it's ridiculous. You know what we see? The King James Bible's right. Hell should be there every single time. This is why we believe it's the inerrant, preserved, perfect Word of God. Right. Every time it shows up, it perfectly fits. We can see, we can, we can, and then it, it, when you have a perfect Word of God, you can cross-reference how we did so many times. So many times, what do we do? We cross-reference and we saw the consistency where maybe the word hell's not used, but the word pit's used. And what does it say? Go down deep into the pit. And it'll use the same type of language. We saw where pit was used and it said, you know, that it, it enlarged its mouth. And what do we see that? We see that with hell as well. Right? So you see how it's perfect consistency. It makes perfect sense. The King James Bible is so intricate. It's, it's a very, you know, uh, uh, you know, in ways it can be very easy to understand, but it's also very deep and complex as well. And when you start changing certain words around, it just messes up all these doctrines in the Bible. Look at it back at chapter number 2, verse number 5. Can't really derive or call a lot from this verse. Uh, we can see some consistency when hell is used elsewhere, but this will be the last, this is the very last occurrence of the term or the word hell in the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 5 says this, <clears throat> Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, now watch this, who enlargeth his desire as, as hell, saying he, enlarge, he enlarges his desire just like what? Just like hell enlarges, right? And we saw that multiple times, how hell enlarges, you know, uh, it's getting bigger, it's increasing, it's, it's enlarging. Why? Because people are dropping into hell constantly. Just every second. In between me, snapping my fingers, multiple people are dying and dropping into hell. That's a frightening, just, just, just terrifying thought of someone just now took their last breath and they literally opened their eyes like the rich man did in hell, in torments. That's a frightening, terrifying, just horrible thought. You know, it, it's, it, that's why it's enlarging because the majority are going there. Just in mass numbers. Like Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to where? Destruction. What did we see hell used with? Destruction. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto what? Life. And few there be that find it. What was, what was contrasted with hell also that we saw? Life. It contrasted life and hell. So notice there, what did Jesus did? He, he contrasted destruction and, li and uh, life. And you know what he knew? You'll understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what? Heaven and hell. That's what he was speaking about. Finish the verse, it says this, And is as death, saying that death enlarges itself as well, death and hell being used interchangeable, and cannot be satisfied. We saw that exact statement about hell as well. It's not satisfied. But gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. You know, heaven is going to ma be made up of all people and nations and kindreds and tongues. But guess what? So is hell. It's going to be made up of all people and nations and kindreds and tongues. There's going to be all different types of people that are in hell. One of those passages that we were reading earlier, I actually showed this to Brother Anthony a few weeks ago. It's real interesting. And in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about the circumcised and the uncircumcised are going to lie slain together in the context of talking about them going down into the pit. Hell is going to be made up of all different types of people. All different types of people. Just like heaven's going to be made up of all different types of people. You know, there's going to be a lot of people from this city that are dying and they're going to go to hell. But you know what we need to do here? We need to take our job and our responsibility serious. Amen. We need to stop you know, uh, 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 being, being you know, caught up in the things of this world and, and in the things that we're doing in our lives that seem more importantly. You know what we need to do? We need to start thinking about others. Yeah. And start thinking about and, and, and reflect for a few minutes on how horrible hell is. You know, I had preached a full sermon on the subject of hell. I mentioned it 
But I hadn't preached a full sermon on the subject of hell the whole time that the church we've had the church. This was the first time. Hell is a terrible, horrible, horrible place. That passage about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram dropping in and descending down into the pit is a terrible, terrible passage. It's horrible. Obviously, I'm not having sympathy on them. I'm thinking about the fact of people burning for all eternity in general. Just in general, people dying and going to hell. It's a hor It's just the description of how it works when someone drops into the pit and now all eternity in front of them and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The worst part about hell is that it's eternal. And those people that died and I snapped my fingers a moment ago, what was that, three minutes ago, four minutes ago, five minutes ago? Four minutes went by, they have all of eternity. Five minutes went by, they have all of eternity. The rich man died. I don't, you don't know exactly when that took place, but let's say two, around 2,000 years ago, he's still begging for a drop of water. He's still screaming out. Still screaming out for a drop of water, a single drop of water. Hell is horrible. Every time it comes up, it's horrible. It's affliction, it's sorrow, it's fire, it's deep into the lower parts of the earth, it's dark, it's, it's, it's the worst place imaginable. And you have the key and you have the message that you could bring to somebody's door even this afternoon and deliver a person from that. Just like David spoke of delivering their soul from hell or delivering his soul from hell. You hold the power and the authority in your hands when you carry around that King James Bible and going to someone's door and knock on their door. You could change that person's destiny for all eternity and give them access to the way of life. Give them access and, and help and take part in that of delivering their soul from hell. Let's reflect on how bad hell is every once in a while. Let's think about how horrible it is. Think about the feeling like when you got saved. I can still remember how terrified I was. I remember it so clearly. Because it was such a strong terror. When I really understood, hey, hell is a real place of real fire and real torment. I'll be away from my family. I'll be away from all of my friends. I'll be all by myself in this dark, deep place. All these different people. I have no idea who they are. There's smoke. I'm choking. It's dark. I can't see anything. And I'm being burned in flames for all eternity. It's a horrible thought. And those same people are going to receive just a moment of relief when they're brought up to be judged. And then guess what? Thrown back into the lake of fire. Just all eternity in front of them. Can you imagine burning in hell for, for 8,000 years? And then being brought up and having a moment of relief? Just to stand before the creator of the universe and him to stand there and judge you based upon the life that you lived and condemn you for breaking his commandments and then telling and announcing and proclaiming to an angel, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. How horrible! There are people that that is going to happen to in this city and you have the opportunity to have compassion on them and make a difference. Let's take the job of soul winning and saving people seriously. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the power of the gospel. We 